All right, welcome back. Uh, so far in this unit of energy production, we've been talking about sources of energy that have been our traditional sources of energy. So things like fossil fuels and nuclear power. Today we're gonna to focus on the renewable resources. Um, a lot of different resources here that are actually considered more of the energy resources of the future. Uh, with this, a lot of our discussion today is gonna to be looking at actually some calculations about how we can determine how much energy can be harnessed from these natural sources um, and how we can go about designing these resources to give us the output that we want. So our topic today is the renewables. Uh, and the main three renewable resources that we're gonna be talking about are wind power, solar power, and hydropower. Now these aren't the only renewable resources, um, but they are the three main ones when we talk about uh, creating electricity. So to start us off, I would like you to reflect back to our discussion about renewable versus non-renewable from before and think to yourself from this list, which of these resources are considered to be renewable resources? So one of the, the main things here, uh, the easiest way to think about it is to get rid of all the examples that are fossil fuels. So petroleum, natural gas, coal, and propane are all fossil fuels. And then nuclear power, our topic from the last lesson is also not renewable. Um, so anything left on this list, solar, geothermal, wind, hydropower, and biomass are all considered to be renewable resources along the context that we are defining that. So when we talk about renewable resources, there are a couple complexities that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, yes, some examples that we'll talk about are as simple as hooking up like a wind turbine to harness the wind that's there, or setting up a solar panel to harness the solar energy. But something that people don't realize is that the energy that we use, especially electricity, is not used evenly throughout the day. Um, we have energy load requirements that change as the day goes on. Um, and this changes from summer to winter as well. But typically, if we think of like a nice summer day, uh, our peak demand shows up sometime here around like afternoon and evening. Um, this is used to uh, power air conditioning as well as to power lights, and electronics. Uh, we don't use electricity too much at night, um, but we do kind of throughout this middle of the day. And this has a possibility to be changing quite a bit as more and more cars are being transferred over to electric vehicles as well. Because if you think about it, if the car is powered by electricity rather than fossil fuels, uh, you get home and you plug in that car and all of a sudden, if everyone's getting home around the same time, the load on the grid is gonna change dramatically when people get home, you're gonna see a huge spike when people are plugging in their cars. Now, the problem with renewable resources is you can't necessarily control when the electricity is being provided. Um, you can't just make it windier during the day um, obviously, solar power is uh, going to provide more during this middle of the day period, but not every day is sunny. Um, so how can you get around this energy load requirement while still being able to harness energy in this renewable way? Now, in the U.S., uh, there are a variety of different renewable resources. As I mentioned, we're going to talk today about three main ones, hydropower, wind, and solar here. Um, but biofuels and wood are also considered to be renewable resources because you could grow more trees in a time scale that that is a useful time scale. It's not like creating more fossil fuels. Uh, if you look at kind of the breakdown in the U.S., biomass is still by far the largest what we consider a renewable resource that we are using, um, followed by hydroelectric. Um, then wind and solar are both on the rise, but are trailing behind those two. But if we put that in context, compared to other resources uh, that the US is using, notice where renewable resources and the nuclear power that we were referring to last lesson, how that stacks up against the fossil fuels that we started this with. So there's a lot of conversation about renewable resources and nuclear power um, kind of taking the place of fossil fuels in the future. But I think this graph shows more than anything just how big of an uphill battle that is. Um, that, that isn't a quick one for one uh, transition. We are still heavily dependent on fossil fuels for our resources here in the US and beyond. 
So let's focus first on wind power. Um, most of you probably actually have a pretty good basic awareness of how wind power works because uh, you've seen wind turbines or windmills as you're driving down the highway. Now, wind power, a lot of people don't realize, comes from the sun. So our first step in this journey is actually solar energy. Solar energy is responsible for warming up the land. Um, it warms up the land more than it warms up bodies of water just because of specific heat capacity. So if the air over land gets warmer, warm air rises and it rises up, then cold air swoops in to take its place. And that is what wind is. And a lot of people don't realize that, that wind is just a differential in temperature and then air swooping in to take the place um, from cold air to warmer air. So solar energy turns into kinetic energy of wind, which then turns a turbine, which results in a kinetic energy of the turbine. And then that turbine has a generator, so magnets and coils of wire that with motion create electricity. In the US, it's important to know kind of where the wind speeds are. Not every location is ripe for a, a turbine farm. Um, so you can see certainly in the Great Plains area, there's a lot of wind speed. Uh, Minnesota, Iowa, are also pretty big producers of wind power. Um, and you can also see that along the coast, uh, out in the ocean, just off the coast, there are several wind farms that actually are in the ocean itself because the wind speeds are pretty high. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. Um, the wind speeds are higher when there aren't as many uh, geographical features and it is a nice flat surface for wind to pick up speed. Now, there are a lot of different uh, reasons that people don't want certain types of energy. And uh, I always find this interesting that one of the big reasons that people have against wind power isn't necessarily that it's a bad source of energy. I think no one is of the mindset that, that wind power is not uh, a good, clean alternative. Um, but often comes down to this acronym. NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. So people love the idea of wind power for the most part. Um, they just don't want to see it. Uh, and there, there is a stigma that people don't want these wind farms uh, in their line of sight. It's one of the big reasons that even though uh, the coast and right off in the ocean is actually a great spot to harvest wind energy, people don't want the horizon uh, being limited by having a wind farm out there. Um, so even though there's many arguments against lots of different resources, uh, there is still a vocal um, select number of people that are against wind power for this reason. We're not gonna get too much into uh, other windmill, cancer, and uh, birds, uh, those sorts of things that are going against it because really that argument doesn't hold a whole lot of weight. Now, there is actually a calculation that I expect you to be able to do uh, surrounding wind power. And it comes down to this first calculation that we actually know already. Kinetic energy is just one half mass times velocity. So I wanna show you how this can actually turn into our wind speed and wind turbine energy calculation. Now, if I wanna find actually the power that is going on with, um, with wind, so we take the energy divided by time. Um, watts is just joules per second. Um, so ultimately, that's what I want to be able to get out of this wind turbine. Now, the important factors I need to know are the area that these blades sweep. Um, all of our wind turbines are going to be circles. So um, the area is just the radius uh, squared times pi. Uh, and the radius, in this case, is just going to be the length of the wind turbine blade. We will also need to know um, the size of this cylinder of air. Um, the cylinder of air in this case has a height that is just the distance that the the wind travels so velocity times time and if we multiply those together the area base times height we get this uh, volume of air is just the area times the velocity times time now if i wanted to turn that into a mass uh, i need to know the density of the air air density is represented by this uh, kind of curly looking P symbol. Uh, we call, call that as a Greek letter rho. Uh, and that is representing our density. If I multiply our um, volume by density, I can turn that into a mass. Now, why all of this is important 
is that mass can be plugged back into this kinetic energy equation. Uh, if I plug that in for the mass here, uh, I get one half times a v t rho times velocity squared. The t, the time aspect, actually cancels out. So this power calculation, if I combine those velocities, simplifies down to the power of a wind turbine can be found one half times the area times rho, the density, times the velocity cubed. And let's look at this data booklet equation because you will always have access to this anytime I give you um, a problem that needs it. Uh, so variables they need to know. Again, area is A. Uh, that's in meters squared. That will always be a circle, so pi r squared. Um, rho is the air density. That's going to be given to you in kilograms per cubic meter. And then V is the velocity. Um, and that's in meters per second. Now, something I want to point out here that's kind of interesting about this equation is this is one of the first equations that we've seen so far that actually uses a cubic quantity. Um, velocity is cubed, and it's important to know what that's going to end up meaning for us. So if you double the wind speed, you are not doubling the power. You're not even quadrupling the power. Sometimes we saw that squared factor happening, but now velocity is cubed. So if I double the wind speed, I'm actually cubing that. So 2 cubed, 2 times 2 times 2, will give us a wind speed factor, uh, a multiplier for of 8 for the power if I double the wind speed. Now, I would like you to think to yourself, what would happen to the power if the wind speed then tripled? How much would the power be multiplied by if I tripled the wind speed? So it's a pretty simple calculation. Uh, it's just 3 cubed. 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 again is 27. So just tripling the wind speed gives you 27 times more power. And this can be calculated out as well. So given the turbine having a blade length of 12 meters and a wind speed of 15 meters per second, I'd like you to find the power output uh, if the density of air is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, so go ahead, grab a piece of paper, and try to calculate this out for yourself um, before I show you the answer. If I plug in these values, um, knowing that area is going to be pi r squared, I end up getting a value of 916,000 watts. It's a huge amount of power. Um, ultimately, uh, no wind turbine is going to be able to get a perfect efficiency. That's actually the power of the wind. Um, that's not necessarily the power of the wind turbine. So if I said that the efficiency was somewhere around 45%, um, all you'd have to do to figure out how much power the turbine actually produces is multiply this value by, oh, sorry. Uh, you could also consider this to be in megawatts, uh, since it's such a large number. So you can multiply this megawatt number by 0.45, 45%, to get the power output is just under half of that original total. Okay, finally here, I want to show you that uh, this efficiency can be found in another way. And that's by seeing how the power of the wind changes before and after. So the perfect wind turbine, in theory, uh, would be a wind turbine that harnesses all of the power of the wind. And what, you, what that would actually mean in practice is on the front side of your wind turbine, you have a really windy day, and on the back side is totally still that there's no power left in that air. The problem with that is it can't be totally still because if it was, then there wouldn't be space for the, the wind from the front of the turbine to actually go. So we can calculate this out by comparing the before and the after. Um, so this problem goes through all the details. Uh, the highlights here, basically, you can calculate from the initial wind speed of nine meters per second, um, what that looks like for our power. And you can calculate what the final wind speed is going to look like as well. Also notice here that the um, density of the air changes. It's actually more dense after it passes through the blades than before. And then the power that is actually harnessed by the, the wind turbine itself is just what the difference is between these. So if this was the power before, this is the power of the wind after, the power that was harnessed and removed is somewhere around 53,000 watts.